So happy to be here with you all. We're going to do a little bit of a special focus this evening. Um, unfortunately, I will be out of town next Wednesday. Um, Jenny's going to be here doing a Feeding Your Demons. So if you all haven't done that in, in Well of Being Wednesdays, we um, used to have wonderful Chandra Easton joining us, and she would do Feeding Your Demons. And the real overlap between the practices that I um, aim to offer here and feeding your demons is this direct turning towards what's difficult and in the feeding your demons practice for those who maybe haven't done it you use imagination to create a little bit of a decentering from whatever it is that's difficult in your life you're trying to work with um, and the feeding your demons is a creative practice you imagine this difficult part of your life your loneliness your sorrow um, come on in friends so we saved one there with the gray blanket, these two. Mm -hmm. I have some friends visiting tonight, always wonderful. I mean, you're all friends. And nice to have some folks in from out of town. And so the Feeding Your Demons practice, it gives us an opportunity to really identify, make friends with, and then even have compassion for our demons. I wonder, is anyone in the room part of the study that we did for Feeding Your Demons back in 2017 with the Dharma Collective? Yeah. So we did, you know, some community-based participatory research here in the center with Feeding Your Demons. And some of our um, participants here did Feeding Your Demons for 30 days and filled out diaries and journals. We analyzed the diaries and journals. And just so beautiful, you know, a lot of what people reported was empathy for the demon. This part of myself that I try to eject or push away, I understand it. Um, so anyway, little preamble, but um, yeah, it's such a beautiful practice and such a nice one to do in the week of Halloween and Dia de los Muertos, which I feel is a time in our contemporary culture and society here where we allow ourselves to look towards what's scary. And though Halloween isn't exactly about meeting your fear of death, um, there is like just this different energy, right? Of, you know, turning towards the darkness and kind of the shadow and the unknown. And then Dia de los Muertos, as many folks know, the event that now happens at Petro del Sol Park, but has been happening in the mission for over 30 years. Such a beautiful opportunity to, um, you know, honor and rejoice in these traditions that help us be with impermanence and death and help us make friends with impermanence and death. And there's such an alignment. We were called as the Dharma Collective to start participating in Dia de los Muertos because the Dharma is such an intimate way for us to connect with impermanence and death. Um, there's a, um, I have to remember, what was the name? I was looking up. Yeah, um, some of you might know Chokinima Rinpoche, who's the older brother of Silkni Rinpoche, we talk about a lot in this room. And he says, if you can actually remember to do practices on impermanence, 50% of the spiritual path would be taken care of, no problem. Meaning, if you could remember every day that you're going to die, you would be 50% farther along on your spiritual path than anything else. So it means you can meditate less. And <laughs> saying for folks who find that challenging it's a it's another very powerful way in and we've done um, in this community many times kind of this reflection on the four remembrances and i really wanted to find a new way to offer that practice so what we're going to do this evening <clears throat> is sometimes they're called the four remembrances or the four reminders they are these invitations to help us uh, turn the mind towards impermanence and, you know, the intention is not a morbid one. The intention is to kind of give us that intense clarifying insight that helps us with our motivation and helps us with our compassion as well. So what I think we'll do is start with a practice just to kind of settle in and I'll bring up these four remembrances and then we're going to unpack them a little together. Because sometimes the four remembrances, the way we hear them, like the terms, it feels heavy and it can bring up a kind of a reactive energy. We might not want to be thinking about this or I know for myself, sometimes hearing 
you know, this precious human life makes me feel like I'm not doing enough with this precious, I just ate nachos in this precious human life. Is that the right thing? <laughs> Is that what I need to be doing? Right, like there's a way that sometimes it provokes this like resistance. So we're gonna, you know, listen and bring compassion to the four remembrances and then unpack them one by one to find examples of how we might experience this in our daily life. Like, how does this actually show up? Um, one simple example is <clears throat> I really try to use every time I get in a car as an opportunity to remember the preciousness of human life. Because, you know, you don't know, right, where you'll end up. And it's so easy to just not pay attention that we are cruising at however many miles across asphalt with all these other boxes next to us and just be like, oh, I'm just in a car doing my thing. But how can we use our everyday life experiences to help connect with these practices? That's my aim. And I do hope we get back to our, our beautiful text. There's a stanza or two I'd like to share <clears throat> for folks who haven't been coming as regularly. We've been making our way through the first couple chapters of the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. And we're still in the chapter very much focused, and next chapter will be two, but on developing mindfulness and what um, Pema Chodron describes as vigilance of the mind. And not a vigilance as in there's something wrong, but the vigilance as in it's important to pay attention. And again, this beautiful metaphor, the kind of attention that you pay as you're walking along a steep cliff. That's a lot of attention. I think of um, um, Fort Funston there, like that's a really steep cliff, right? If you're there, you don't want to be tumbling down. So there's kind of this present awareness. So that kind of level of how do we tether this wild elephant of the mind? That's a lot of the emphasis. And part of the reason we learn mindfulness, you know, to calm this wild elephant of the mind and also to remember, to keep in mind things just like these four remembrances. So there's a real beautiful weaving and overlap. So we'll start in for a briefer practice, probably just 10 or 15 minutes, and very much aligned with this guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. We'll start with Bodhicitta. And I haven't kind of explained Bodhicitta for a while, so I'll give us a little bit more unpacking of that. And then I will bring up the four remembrances and this is a different kind of practice in that you're, be, you're going to hear a single phrase. And the way I like to think about it is you're not then thinking about the phrase. You're watching how the phrase lands in the heart and the body and the mind. So when the phrase comes up, you don't need to lean out or to listen or to understand. Just notice how it settles in the body. And we'll do that and kind of bring ourselves through those remembrances and then find a little spacious awareness in which our bodhicitta is always already there. So let's begin by finding a posture that supports our practice. One where we feel this sacred opportunity of being a human body. A bridge from heaven above and all the spaciousness, transcendence, and beauty. Down to this earth below and the beauty of our relatedness, our connection, our stability. And the dignity of being that bridge between heaven and earth invites the spine to be supple, upright, And also asks, asks us to be porous and gentle, softening through the face and the chest and the belly.
And as we settle in towards this more inward space, maybe feeling the gentle rise and fall of the breath. Also probably, probably noticing the, the whirl and stir of the mind. And giving ourselves the invitation to feel ourselves in this space. Feeling that now there is darkness already outside these doors as we begin. For those in the room, the presence of others right here, their breathing bodies. And for friends online and at home, the sense of the familiarity of space, other beings in that space with you. and arguably the most important part of our practice, setting this clear motivation and intention, bodhicitta, the awakened heart. And this simple intention or motivation, it can become a bit over-familiar. We, we say, yes, I am here for the service of all beings, but we might not feel that. So being curious about what might really spark the feeling within us. Thinking of the lines of Shantideva and the suffering of beings is immeasurable. The one remedy, realization. There's both a responsibility and a beauty in this awakened heart. Yes, it allows us to think and consider the weight of the world. And also the sacred opportunity to be here with an open heart, even as this world is on fire. Feeling this whole body as a body of compassion and kindness. And finding that spark of aliveness within it. That spark of bodhicitta that can radiate and emanate. moment or two more here, seeing if we connect to the essence of the heart's longing to be free, intrinsically tied to our availability for others, our love, our care, our presence. 
whether it feels like a longing or a fullness or even a, a hard to grasp sensation, just giving ourselves a couple more moments to tune in to this transmission that we are already this love and compassion. It is what we are here for, what we are made for. And what we so deeply need to keep continuing to make space for. And allowing the sense of bodhicitta to really fill and saturate the body, heart, mind. And letting ourselves settle more deeply into practice by following the breath. Noticing the subtle inhale as the air travels in through the nostrils. And the subtle sensations of exhale as the air returns back into spaciousness all around. And focusing on this very subtle sensation of breath at the nostrils allows the mind to rest in one place, one thing to do, to be fully given to the breath and the practice. It doesn't matter how many times we get carried away with thoughts, or memories, or images. Every time we return, we can feel that sense of rejoicing, relaxing, entering the breath once more, noticing these subtle sensations, the breath traveling in just a bit cooler through the nostrils, and the breath traveling out warmer, re-emerging into the space around it. And now shifting our attention and awareness from the breath and the body to the mind and imagination. These four remembrances designed to help us move through and reflect upon these simple but easy to miss understandings of life. The invitation here is to notice what's the experience in the body, 
and the heart, and to a lesser extent, the mind. And as we receive these simple phrases and feel their meaning. The first phrase is to feel the preciousness of this human life how free and well favored it is, how difficult to gain, how easy to lose. Feeling the preciousness of human life, so difficult to gain, so easy to lose. What an opportunity to do something meaningful. And in using the second turning of the mind with the words from Chogyam Trimpa, The world and its inhabitants are impermanent. Especially the life of beings is like a bubble. Death comes without warning, and this body will be a corpse. As we hold these phrases, again, noticing the shifts in the body, even in the perception of words or space or time. Maybe there is a feeling or emotion that moves through. Being the caring, observing of our experience without getting too lost in the experience. The world and its inhabitants are impermanent. Especially the life of beings is like a bubble. Death comes without warning. This body will be a corpse. And the third reminder, remembrance. Every action and every inaction through body, speech, and mind has a consequence and result. Our behaviors today implicate the future we live in tomorrow. Every action and inaction of body, speech, and mind has a result and consequence. In this law of karma, we see that our actions of today implicate the future of tomorrow. Again, checking in for a moment, if we can feel that we are a loving presence that is hearing and receiving and experiencing. And 
Maybe that loving presence feels like warmth or spaciousness. Maybe even the gentle hug of our own awareness. Remembering our motivation to do this work. And the fourth reminder, remembrance, seeing clearly, that seeking and finding and building our happiness in the external world will never create satisfaction at the deepest level. Being caught up in samsara will eat up all our time and never bring lasting happiness. Letting loving awareness be the host. Noticing the experience of listening and receiving. Being in deep contemplation of what these instructions intend for us to see, know, to hear. Seeking our refuge, our satisfaction, our well-being in the material world cannot bring sustaining happiness and well-being. Samsara will take up all of our time and not offer us a true taste of liberation. And feeling great compassion for the ways we forget. We fall asleep. We get caught up in samsara. We act in ways that don't support our well being or those of others. We forget that loss is inevitable. And this human life becomes something we take for granted. See if we can generate a sense of deep compassion for this forgetting. Feeling that loving awareness as presence. And releasing all the words and concepts and leaning back in the mind. Finding that there is enough space warmth and openness for everything to move through the thoughts the feelings the resistance more and more space more and more space Maybe just a glimpse of that sense of loving awareness, spaciousness, can offer so much nourishment and refreshment.
feeling or imagining how bodhicitta is infused with the spacious awareness. Thank you for your practice, for your willingness, for your courage. In this Well of Being Wednesday, we have the opportunity to be in community together. It's such a beautiful opportunity. And this Sangha really. Um, I think exemplifies that the Buddha of the future is the Sangha. <laughs> so everyone here is part of our awakening. And when we engage in dialogue here, we can hold that sacred vision that each and every one of us are already Buddhas, right? And so when we listen to one another, we listen to one another with that kind of heart and eyes and, and ears of reverence, care, oh. devotion, for one another. And when we speak, we speak from that kind of care for one another deeply as well. That allows us to really be able to learn from one another in a way that feels comfortable. So I would love to hear if folks had reflections um, or questions, and then we will dive in a bit to each of these four remembrances a bit. Um, I know some, some of us practiced this quite recently. For others, it might be your first time. There are, um, there's no questions that are kind of um, outside of the bounds of worthwhile unless they don't have to do with this practice at this moment. <laughs> so please, just about this practice. Yeah, questions or reflections. And especially, I hadn't said this a while, but I'm, I'm loving seeing some newer faces or different faces here. And if I haven't heard from you, if you haven't shared in the room and you feel so inclined, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and also friends who share and who are part of this community often love to hear from you also. Just invitation. Or no one, just kidding. <laughs> Just smooth sailing, no big deal. Think about death, we're good. Anybody, question or reflection? Eve, Claudia has her hand up. Oh, okay, I can't see it. Hi, Claudia. I'm not sure if you're muted, but we can't hear you. Yeah, I just did. Oh, there you are. Well, Diane Hi. unmuted me and then I just did. Okay. Um, yeah, just just some reflections, um, particularly the last one where you talked about the delusion of finding happiness and satisfaction outside. And the way it landed in my body, I mean, it was just mm -hmm. straight to my heart. And I, I just felt like, you know, from my own experience, the preciousness of my inner kingdom, as you sometimes refer to my inner yeah. life, that refuge. I just, I just loved it. And yeah. at the end of the meditation, I even hugged myself, you know, cause I just, <laughs> I, I, yeah, love it. Mm. And, and yes, compassion also, because I do let myself uh, be tempted at times by the material world. <laughs> 
know, got to recognize that. But um, I just very much really cherish that that inner life, that inner mm. refuge. Really, really, really love it. And then the second one where you talked about death. Mm. It's funny. The very first thing that came to mind, it was like rest. You know, like rest. rest. Yeah. But then my body felt mm. really heavy about the corpse. Mm. It just, the body felt really heavy. Yeah. So, I don't know. That was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Claudia. Mm -hmm. I think, I especially love that, like, oh yeah, I love this inner refuge. You know, why, why am I... Um, you know, seeking elsewhere what is what is right here. And I don't want to create a, a false dichotomy between like hedonic well being and then, you know, this maybe inner sense of well being. Both are great. It's just when we it's like it's kind of the balance, like how much time are we investing? And if we're honest, like most of us, what percentage like towards our hedonic well being versus our spiritual growth? Like 80 90 percent right so it's you know the invitation of these remembrances i think they you know they're intended in some ways to kind of be this um this wake-up call of can we start seeing clearly what is truly of benefit so that we're more motivated like these remembrances less than being you know a calming meditation or an expansive practice or i mean they really in some ways are like catalysts for behavior change like you're listening to them in a meditative state because that's where you can be porous and open. And especially if you notice it, like I love that you noticed it in your body, Claudia, because you notice it in your body and there's this different tangible reality to it, right? And um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think that's why, yeah, who is it? I'm just, again, look at all these quotes. Um, One teacher, who was it who said this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Atisha, who's a quite famous um, early Buddhist teacher. And he said, if you don't contemplate death in the morning, you've wasted your morning. And if you don't contemplate death in the afternoon, you've wasted your afternoon. And if you don't contemplate death in the evening, you've wasted your evening. So it's like, Wow. Um, and I think there's a way, you know, I, I do also, I understand what you're saying, Claudia, about the heaviness. I think that, you know, when this practice becomes, I, I've gone through, I'm not doing this now, but I was for a number of months waking up every day. And that was my first practice of remembering like, wow, what a gift. And it shifts away from heavy to rejoicing. Mm. So though it may and can understandably, especially if we imagine, you know, in the way that uh, Trungpa describes that second remembrance. It's really about us. Um, you know, this body will be a corpse, but it's like all beings are impermanent. That's a hard. That's a hard and heavy thing to to feel, as you said, in the body. And our regular practice of it. You know, one of the um, supposed benefits is we become so clear on impermanence and loss that we don't get. It's not that we don't care and we don't feel. We don't get quite so destabilized. Mm -hmm by the natural process of loss that is part of life. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Yes. Where is that mic? Oh, thanks, Ron. Yeah. And will you say your name, please? Sure. Yeah. My name is Tony. Nice Hi, to Tony. Meet you. Yeah. Here. yeah. Um, meditating on death has been really powerful for me, and I I'm a little confused. I guess I have questions around. It has get. Uh, I have had feelings where it's almost like I have died while meditating. Yeah. And it has brought me a lot of peace and fear from, like removal of fear from death. But I've briefly mentioned that to someone before, and they thought it was weird. They're like, I just, what a what is? Um, yeah. It's brought a lot of peace. It's not scary. Yeah. Bless you. Um, but what is the thinking behind that? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And when when you're experiencing that in practice, is there literally a cognitive thought like I'm now I'm dead, I'm already dead, or is it more of a sense like a 
anyway, sorry, let me have you describe it before I guess what it's like. Um, it's a, yeah, I, I'm not actually sure. Um, let me think. It's very hard to describe practice, yeah. It's, yeah, it's as if, uh, it's not one thought, it's just as, it's just a feeling that I'm removed and, yeah, yeah, detached, but not in a yeah. cold way. Yeah, yeah, and um, though I wish I could firsthand experience your practice, uh -huh. um, I can't, but my, my best guess is like, you know, maybe um, a couple things might be happening. Um, when we really deepen into our practice, we're deepening into what is often described as our deeper being, right? So there's a surface being and exists in our surface channels. As we move through the world, we just kind of have to, right, in order to get things done. And we sometimes, in moving through the world at the surface level, like I associate myself with my name or my profession or my, you know, whatever this surface level is, we forget that there's something sacred deeper than that surface level. In the same way, sometimes before, maybe some of you remember this, before you start meditating, you think your entire mind is thoughts. It would make sense to think that. And then you're like, whoa, there's awareness too? Like there's something other than thoughts? And so similarly, dropping into this deeper being, it's like that, that whole process of surface dies. And very commonly in the traditions that I've learned from, there's this great aspiration to die before you die and to die every day. So as a, as a sacred shedding, right? And the really interesting thing I've been thinking about in, in this process of especially dying to our habits that no longer serve us, right? So some of the, um, you know, neurotic thinking, fear-based thinking, self-criticism, like all those habits, they're like, we think they are who we are, but they're just a way we've learned to be in the world and react to the world. And when they soften and die, it's, it feels pretty naked. And sometimes there can be like a unsteadiness even. And so to find the stability, it's so wonderful that you feel peace in that. So that's one possible pointing out or you know thing that could be happening. And another thing that happens when we're kind of more dropped in with practice is we start to experience more aliveness in the subtle body or the body that's more than the form body. And that subtle body has such a sense of peace. And then we can experience what's sometimes described as an absorption within our practice. And there's just this natural peace. And we're not thinking of who we are. Like our, uh, what is um, described as one of my teachers as our ongoing identity project. I love that, you know, like kind of, a lot of the content that comes up in meditation supports our identity project, right? Like, who am I going to call? What am I going to do? What's going to happen? Like all these next, next, next. But when we experience that deep sense of presence within ourselves through the subtle body, it's almost like that, that stops being so present. Kind of both and can be occurring. Yeah. I don't think it's crazy at all. I think you're very fortunate. Um, it's really nice to be able to, again, think of it not as like, oh, I always need to get here, but I am able to so deeply nourish my mind, heart, and body by touching this state. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay, I see Christine, two hands online. Yeah. yeah. Three, Christine, Leon, and Jason. Okay. Who's up first? Hello, it's Christine. Hi, Christine. Nice to see Hello. you. Hello. Thank you. Um, I really appreciated the part of the meditation regarding death and what the previous person had said about the heaviness in the body. Um, I had a near-death experience in a medical setting about two and a half years ago. And... It was peaceful, it was calm, it was not scary, it was not anything except the impermanence of that moment. Mm. And 
Um, I find myself in my meditation practice trying to get back to that feeling mm. of calm and impermanence. Mm. Yeah. And I'm open for feedback and suggestions. <laughs> oh, you're, you got it. Um, and it is, and I'm so glad you're here with us and not on the other side. And also, yeah, it's so beautiful. I mean, it is, it's not so unusual. It's interesting, the near-death experiences. But what's so somewhat startling is how commonly you hear, mostly in anecdotal research, not like truly rigorous research that I've seen, that people have a profoundly meaningful experience with their near-death experience. It really does help them. It's like it is the four remembrances in a condensed form. Mm. Um, and how to get back there, you know, of course, many yogis, they like to practice in the graveyard, right? Or to practice somewhere where really we can remember. It's, death is hidden from us. We don't see it. And so how do we come back and remember? Um, and, you know, there is an opportunity in the world we're living in to use um, seeing the horrific images that we see every day in the news as a reminder, not of those people, right? But that all of us are impermanent. And I think that's a profound way to kind of meet that suffering as an opportunity. Um, and then also, I, I don't know if this was the case, I was super fortunate to also have a very profound near-death experience back in 2019. And for me, the experience in the body was very palpable. I don't know if that was true for you. And so that like, when I re-inhabited my body after wherever it was, um, it felt so precious. And so that seems to be the thing I try to come back to is like, I really did was like, oh my gosh, like, oh gosh, being in a body, you know? So I think whatever, yeah. you know, whatever like palpably you can feel, um, but it's, it's a wonderful um, opportunity to work with it. and. Yeah, and I think in general, like, how do we make these practices feel very alive for us in our everyday life? And if it's not our personal experience, it can be for others. Some of you may be familiar with um, uh, Stephen Levine's book, A Year to Live, and Vinnie Ferraro and many other wonderful teachers support that year-long program here in the Bay Area and also worldwide. And one of the teachings that Stephen offers in the book is every time you feel sick, like you have a flu, cold, pretend you're never gonna get better. Use that as a meditation on impermanence and death. Like instead of this is a cold and I'll get better, like, oh, this is the end of my life. And just, I, I, that blew my mind. I think it's such an interesting um, way, again, to kind of make these feel more alive and then make them feel the meaning that you're describing. Like I re I, when I recognize that here I was, another chance, Wow. And so when we get better from being sick, instead of like, oh, that was annoying, <laughs> right? We have this like, wow, you know, I get to be alive. How wonderful. Thanks, Christine. Jason, I can't see the other name well enough, so I just will say Jason for now. And then you can tell me. Can you see it, Ron? What's that name? Oh, my gosh, Leanne. Been so long. Okay, we'll hear from Jason, and then we'll get to you. I, I'm sorry, I unmuted Leanne. Okay, Leanne, go for it. Uh oh. She's not unmuted though. Okay, sorry, I I muted myself back when she said that <laughs> Jason was gonna go first, and I, I we're not allowed to unmute. Um, hi. Um, hi there. This was such an appropriate practice for today because I've been um, like really, really trying to become intentional about intentional with morning meditations, not just the practice of meditation, but contemplation um, mm -hmm. and sort of like working with the bodhisattva vow a little bit and um, and just paying attention to the power of language and how reading or saying certain words can really like the resonance that they carry in the body yeah and i've 
sort of been waiting all week to ask you, like, is there a, for, for book recommendations that are really like each morning, a, sh a, you know, a quick yeah or something that can kind of just be a picky yeah. reflection. Absolutely. And I can't remember, Leanne, if you were, you know, um, attending sessions when we were doing the Lojong slogans, the 59 Lojong, that's oh. a really, um, classic and wonderful um, way. And there's actually this really cool website. Diane, I don't know if you still have that website. I think you sent it. Yeah. If you could share it with Leanne in the chat, it has all the 59 Lojong slogans and commentary from so many different teachers. And, you know, the slogans, they bring us, you know, largely to be able to understand the importance of settling the mind and, and cultivating compassion much like this text, much like many texts. But some of the famous slogans are, you know, give up all hope of fruition, uh, turn adversity into the path. Um, mm. But there's some other ones that are even less, like, immediately understandable, like, don't be so predictable. And then, mm -hmm. okay, what does that, you know, what does that mean? What's that actually asking me to do and to meet? So I think that would be a great one. And another book we did here a couple of years ago by Mathieu Ricard, which is called On the Path to Enlightenment. And each mm -hmm. chapter is, there's a whole um, focus on different aspects of uh, Buddha Dharma and the quotes from his favorite teachers. And he's, in, in my opinion, just such a beautiful living example of devotion. And he has translated and retrieved so many ancient um, Tibetan texts that would have otherwise never made it into uh, contemporary culture and time. And we did that book here and those each one of those quotes you could sit with for a week or a month. So both. Great question. Okay. Glad to hear of your practice. Thank you. Thanks. Last but not least, Jason. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you for these. I, I feel like the one image that I wanted to share that came during the moment of, of <clears throat> one of the remembrance, I can't even remember which, I, um, was a sense of like, I, as my, that, that my essence was like this pill of energy and light. And mm. on, out, on the outer edge of that was all the accumulated life that I had, the identity mm. and stuff. And I had this sense of like that just peeling away. Mm. And it was so clear to me, like that's something that I haven't really grasped is the, the, the subtle energy self being so, um, so present with it. And then mm. feeling like, wow, you know, all these things that I'm trying to do and be and accomplish are like, um, it was almost as if I had been enshrined or enshrined in jewels, like, oh. sort of like medallions all over my body of stuff that I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you know, look at me. And all of that just <laughs> fell away. So I, yeah. I don't say that because it was just like really wild. Um, mm. But I think yeah. contemplating this came up yeah beautiful and it is it's cool i mean for some of us imagery is so much more the language of our subtle body you know and that will arise as kind of this um instructive aspect of what's of what's really going on and i think those are really reliable to get those images they can kind of be something you know that we can return to or can deepen our understanding um, whether we kind of see or feel you know ourselves again as the sky or the night sky or we feel or see ourselves as sturdy like a tree i think that image language which is a you know i don't even i guess it's conceptual but it's not taking that extra leap conceptually to put into words our experience is a very um yeah beautiful way into self-understanding and insight so thank you and i want us now to just take a little bit more time with these um, with these phrases, and especially think about like, what are the ways that we can make these feel more alive in our everyday life. Um, I think I might have shared this before, but I have found really useful to use um, when airplanes go overhead and you see the contrails as a reminder of impermanence. It happens just enough that it's like okay, like I can remember, but not all the time that it feels, yeah, you know, oh yeah, yeah, impermanence, another airplane. And so like, what are the ways, like that's a kind of a 
honestly a behavioral cue into reminding impermanence, but there's so many ways that we can kind of really think about these reminders and see how they relate to our life. So I'm just curious from folks, yeah, when is the last time you actually felt the preciousness of this human life? Like that it really is precious. And by precious, it also means kind of fragile, right? Does that, anyone have an example? Yes, Josh. It's kind of quick and uh, quite vivid. Uh, this morning was a beautiful surf day. Yes. And uh, I was up in the corner in Kelly's Cove and a, a wave just came in and it was like the most majestic moment in time. <laughs> and you were and like, <laughs> that was just, it was so, uh, it was lovely. Yeah. I mean, the fluidity, the timing, the balance, the motion, I mean, it was just it was all like yeah. right there. Beautiful. Yeah. And I think what you're highlighting is recognizing the preciousness of this human life can be a lot like awe and gratitude, right? That kind of high saturation potency of, wow, I get to be alive in this body and not take it for granted. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was down at Sloat, so I'm sorry I missed you. Um, but also I, I, I feel it a lot with the, I know I mentioned this last week, but the quality of light right now in the afternoons and it just feels like unbelievably precious to be alive, to be experiencing, and through yet another transition of seasons, um, something very poignant about that quality of light right now. And yeah, curious, anyone else have a preciousness of human life? Like when that reminder doesn't become something you have to remember when it's actually felt. Yeah, Mace. Um, I just, uh, it seems like a bunch of people I know are really not well. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> I'm not super old, but like, um, like our, I guess our, our generation is starting to have more illnesses and so that are significant. And so it's just like you hear about yep. someone and something and it's like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, right. Like that's going to happen yeah. like that, you know, and then my mom is 83 and like every time I talk to her, she's like, so-and-so died and so-and-so died. Not, you know, she's, she's sad about a lot of it and she's just, a lot of it is like, yeah, that's what being 83 is like. Yeah. And so each time that happens, and then also I'm in charge of my aunt who has dementia, who's also 83. And it is just like, yeah. I know this is not this is not Buddhist, but like there by the grace of God go I. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's what happens in my family. We we seem to age and lose our memory. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like this, like, you know, every time I talk to her almost too, and then for her it's like very much in the present moment. Yeah. So there's also that kind of interesting aspect to her dementia, yeah. which is like yep. not always, but sometimes that's that's also seems to be very spacious and relieving to her yeah. when she's there. Yeah. yeah. So all yeah. of that has been like making me think a lot lately. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's Day of the Dead. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Yep. Or almost. Almost. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, one other piece, as I hear you speak, there's a, I think it's important to look at why don't we remember these? Like what's in the way of like looking more directly? And sometimes, like I said, like that idea of, this precious human life feels like a lot of pressure. Like, am I living up to it? And then the other side of it is like, oh man, wow. Like other people don't, aren't so fortunate. And this kind of guilt or, you know, difficult feeling in that way too. Um, so it's, it's interesting to kind of unpack what's in the way of seeing this or what's in the way of meeting it kind of in that open yielding kind of way. Thank you. I see Belinda and Ron. Um, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I'm a first grade teacher, and the students were dissecting owl pellets today. 
Um, so maybe this is a human life, but the delight that they had, like just screaming, like, I have my skull, <laughs> a bone. Um, and just having them like go from being really not wanting to dig in to just the joy and excitement that they mm. found in death. Yeah. Um, it was really beautiful. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> And that was for hand on. Yes. Yep. Hi there. Oh, me? <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, so I'm Victor. And well, for me, uh, I think you really got me thinking uh, when was the last time I felt life was precious? And uh, I'm a dad. I have a 19 year old daughter. Mm. And thinking of her makes me think life is precious. Mm -hmm the connection Thank I have you. with her. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, that this Chogyam Trumpa, I, I really like his writing on it, the, you know, this preciousness of human life, um, difficult to gain, easy to lose, you know, now I must do something meaningful. Yeah, and so even to have that show up in how we want to relate to others, um, such a good reminder. And so then the second of this, I think probably the hardest of the four, you know, death comes without warning, this body will be a corpse. I even found my own voice like lowering, like not like this is news. I'm not sharing bad news with you all. <laughs> like this is news, you know, you know this. And yet I don't even want to say it, right? Um, so I think there's a really interesting one. And how, again, how can we integrate what we see and know and feel through the world that we live in, like how can we make that one feel more real, but not feel maybe so heavy? And um, I remember the last time we did this practice, you shared about um, going to look at different grave sites. Yeah. And that was so meaningful to hear about. And yeah, and you described it with such kind of, yeah. 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 brought it up <laughs> the first time that I went to a um, I have to say a museum but it's not a museum <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 the first time that yeah. I enjoyed it it was when I met Gina and the first day we went to, to a mausoleum a mo mausoleum very to Buddhist date yeah. <laughs> you know, I never, I, I, I was thinking, I would never say to my mother that I went. <laughs> <laughs> she would say, well, you are absolutely crazy going out with this woman. But yeah. What were you doing there, together there? So um, I think that since then, I learned to accept that I was going to be exactly the same as everybody. Yeah. There was no way that I was going to skip that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, accepting that, it's also like letting go. Mm -hmm. It's not being so afraid or it is what it is. Yeah. In whatever, when it comes, we're there. Yeah. 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 Kind of the no big deal. Right, yeah. of course, so important. Yeah. And yet, yeah. Yeah. It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And I, you know, I think I will never forget you describing that, you know, visiting, like, okay, here's where I will be laid to rest. Here's where people will visit. And just that materiality to be able to feel and sense that. Um, so important. And in, um, you know, many of the towns where Dia de los Muertos comes from, you're in the graveyard, right? You're not in a park, you're in the actual graveyard. And wow, like what a palpable, tangible way to feel both the connection and the rejoicing. But yeah, I'm not going to escape this one. <laughs> this is here for me too. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else kind of that, you know, and it's such a, a delicate place to hold that you want to be clear and you want to not fall too much into despair, right? 
I find yeah. that uh, reading obituaries is something that I do. Huh. And I used to do it just to see, well, this person's this person's younger or this person's older, just to sort of like <laughs> compare myself to them. But then, <laughs> Very know, natural. I yeah, think. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then also, I find it just really, um, you know, just sort of invited into their life in a certain yeah. way by their their loved ones who took the time to, yeah. you know, see in the newspaper or whatever that talk about their life and uh, just find it very, um, I don't know, very welcoming, very, um, yeah, it doesn't feel scary so much. It feels like I'm saying, like it's kind of welcoming. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Right, like this too. And one of the other practices in that year to live is to write your own obituary, you know, which is such an interesting um, practice to do. And, you know, maybe if you are a very controlling person and you want someone to get it right, it's not a bad idea <laughs> to have your own version kicking around. Um, but yeah, that's, I haven't thought about that, but it's true. Cause you're like, yeah, of course, even though they did this or they didn't do this, they will die. Even though they had this many children or no children, they will die. Right. You know, just, and, um, I know I've mentioned before, but working here at SF general in the emergency room where there's death every day, I was, you know, I was in my early twenties working there and it was very, very helpful for me to be able to understand the value of living and also just that there's no guarantees. It's not like only sick people come into the ER. Everybody comes into the ER, right? You never know. I also started wearing a bike helmet when I <laughs> working there. Oh my God. So, yeah. So then any others on that second, maybe more difficult and also like what's in the way? Why don't we look at it? You want me to answer that? No. <laughs> Whatever you want, actually. I, I double I double barreled that. So yeah. Um I was thinking about how I um I shared with an elder of mine. Um his name is uh, he's a Lakota elder named Tiokasan Ghost Horse. And I, I shared with him that on my most recent um flight to New York, I saw a forest fire. Mm from the sky and I um, I had never seen an entire forest mm. on fire yeah. from above and uh, so I think it's interesting to me I, I, I was practicing more I think on the level of like death on, on an ecosystem level and um, yeah, it wasn't a, I, I didn't translate it individually necessarily. Mm -hmm. And he said something in response like, um, contemplating the palliative care of our world. Mm. Um, and the opportunity to, maybe paradoxic, he, he said the opportunity to rejoice at the dying of an old world for the emergence of a new world. Mm. And uh, I admit in that moment, I, I felt like this like yearning, this, like I, I yearn to feel that authentically in me. Yeah. I was like, mm. oh, wow, how bold, how brave, how <laughs> courageous to authentically say that I feel that, but mm. I, Instead, I just felt so like sad and helpless yeah. and maybe a little ashamed. Yeah. Um, but the shame wasn't like a me shame. It wasn't yeah. an individual shame. Yeah. It was more like a us, like mm -hmm. a we shame. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose that was the eternal ground of my practice. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sura. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that, you know, we can keep this to the personal and it can also be a portal for the universal, right? And we're, of course, included in that. You know, these forest fires aren't happening to those people over there, right? We're all uh, involved in it. And it is, it is really hard to not feel that kind of overwhelming heartbreak of like, but why couldn't we have done this a little better, you know? And um, 
And, and that idea, you know, that kind of, that leap of there's a new world coming. Um, it's beautiful to hold an aspirational vision that we can't quite meet, right? And so even if that's there, and my friend uh, was telling me the other day, his daughter, I can't remember, I think she must be about seven, asked him like, why do I have to die? And he was like, oh God, I'm not prepared for that question. And he's like, well, in order for things to be born, things need to die. And she's like, no, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and I was like, she's not wrong. It's a hard one to understand. So then like, what's, and then I said to him, you know, what about, like, I love how Thich Nhat Hanh always uses flowers, you know, that it's just, yeah, like, there's the beautiful blossoming, there's the decay, there's a fertilizer for the new, right? And so maybe we can't feel it at the, at the large scale, but we can at least have that little glimmer of, I know, I kind of know what feeling like that could be like just with one flower. Um, yeah, because there, there has to be, or I think the purpose of these is not to make us feel despair and yet it's really hard not to go there, um, given what we see. Yes. And will you remind me your name? Yeah, Sheena, I'm new. Nice yes, yeah. Um, so my brother's a psychiatrist and he sees a lot of really sick people. So I asked him once how he kind of deals with that. Yeah. And he made me read this thing called the egg. So it's basically like, every human could be living every other human's experience. He mm. just sees himself as like 10 bad life things that happen to him away mm. from like the people that he treats. So yeah. now when I like look at people sometimes when they're going through like a really hard time, like someone really sick or someone really old, I like imagine myself mm. in their body. And it's kind of like you said about like, we will die. Yeah. Our bodies will become corpses. Yeah. But I'm like, in a way, it's like, what if I'm everyone, though? Yes. You know I mean? <gasps> Beautiful. Yeah, I'd love to meet your brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's like, you know, imagine doing exactly the opposite of that couldn't happen to me. You know, trying to create this little safety zone where, no, not for me, not for the people I love, like that's out there. So much effort to try and make that. And you're not going to succeed, right? And so instead, that porousness, and I loved how you described it, what if I'm everyone? You know, what does that feel like? Um, yeah, and it is, this is why these remembrances have that, that possibility, not only of, of helping us see clearly what's already here, but of such great compassion, you know, to really feel like, oh, wow, yeah, be insane to not be in this together, because <laughs> we are in this together. Yeah. And then this, the third one, you know, this whole karma thing that people get confused about in a great way. And, you know, I, I think in the remembrances, like, why would this be included? You know, there's, there's quite a lot of Buddhist ideas and, um, you know, important aspects that are not in these four remembrances. So like, why would karma be so important to include? And, you know, I think there is, if there's one thing we can remember, it is like that kind of simple thinking of what am I doing today that will contribute to how I experience tomorrow um, at like every level. And we kind of do forget, especially if we're tired or busy or sad, you know, we're like, I need to just do this thing. It's gonna make me feel good now, like, tomorrow, whatever. Um, or, you know, we rush through and we don't pay attention and maybe we get tight or maybe we get um, self-absorbed, you know. So that idea that to really remember the impact. And I think it's, this is not, this is a not hard one to recognize in our daily life. Anybody feel the effect of karma? <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, again, I'll bring it up again, but I did. I was, it was pretty exciting. I had nachos tonight. I know I mentioned this already. I had probably haven't had them in 10 years. I may feel the karmic retribution. <laughs> I didn't get jalapenos, but um, you know, like what we're doing at our body at that physiological level has an impact. And then what if I, you know, had a friend reach out and say, I'm going through a really hard time. And I look at the phone, I'm like, oh, I'm busy. 
maybe I'll write them back tomorrow. Like that's not doing anything, but it's not doing something. And there's an impact, right? There's, you could say like, will they know? It's like, no, they probably don't know. You could say you were you know, offline or busy or whatever it is, but just the choice of oneself above another that has an impact and a momentum. All of the things we are doing and not doing have a huge cumulative effect. And so to really remember that every day, help keep us kind of in good discipline with our daily behaviors. And this is not to be a boring, unfun person. This is just to be that quintessential facet of Buddhist practice, which is non-harming. The least amount of harm we can do, can we adhere to that and remember that that has a huge consequence? Yeah. Curious, anyone have a example of when they, when this one felt alive, that like, oh, right, the small things or the big things, they really make a, they make a difference in how my life is lived every day. The nachos one is ridiculous. Someone's got to have a better one. Sure. Um, I saw a eagle flying with a bird in his, mm. and he was like really close to me, and it hit me so so much. Yeah. I couldn't sleep all night. I, I was thinking, mm. oh my god, poor little bird. Yeah. Guess what? I get up in the morning. And I see a little bird dead in my patio. Mm. So we took him and we bury him. Mm. Yeah. And we pray for him. So it was, it was in a way horrible. Yeah. Just the idea to see the eagle with the bird living yeah. there. Yeah. And then the bird in my Body yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So well. It's not a total deviation. I mean, a, it's very beautiful to hear the tenderness of your heart with it, and um, you know, it's interesting. You take the bird's point of view and not the eagle's, right? Uh -huh. That's the boundaries of our compassion. Like, go eagle, you got lunch. You might be so hungry, um, but the. The, you know, the compassionate action of caring about a being, even when the being is dead, like that is planting the seeds, right? And I do love how we talk about karma as seeds that are being planted. And when we get rid of our karma, it's not just that we dig out the seeds. In, in the texts and the traditions, you burn the seeds. <laughs> like you can't let them hang out, like you got to burn them. And it's really interesting because the momentum of our karma. It's not just this one act, it creates a momentum, right? And so caring about the life of the bird and then tending to the life of the bird is such a beautiful momentum, right? A compassionate momentum. And that is what we're wanting to highlight and see in our own life, right? Like what are the ways, you know, I started um, through technology, recognizing that when I leave the house is my, often my, peak stress moment of the day. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if I leave the house once a day or like five times if I've gone back, like peak stress moment. And so this idea of, okay, like how can I change that? How can I be compassionate to myself and try to leave the house in a way that's like completely different? And usually that means giving myself 10 minutes more to leave, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, but the momentum against that is so strong, right? So changing these habits, patterns, and behaviors, then that means I show up feeling better, my, my body is better, right? And I also noticed, this cracks me up, that when I leave in a rush, my cats also run around the house because they're like frenzied with me too. Um, and so I'm like, how can I leave the house without the cats running around? Gives it a whole new level of um, really seeing the impact on all of those around you of these simple choices we make, right? Like, and our own karmic momentum, and it implicates others, and it implicates others, and it implicates others. You don't know, like, did somebody see you on your back patio burying the bird? 
and like what an impact that could make. So this is not just what we are doing, right? It's how this implicates the bigger field too. Thank you. Okay, the last one. <laughs> Essentially, you know, samsara doesn't work. Such a bummer. And um, as Sokni Rinpoche says, it like almost works in our contemporary culture because we can stay almost busy enough and almost distracted enough to be really like, I'm on to something. Like, I'm going to get that next thing. I got this other thing coming in the mail. I'm going to go do this thing. Like, you know, just those little hits of just enough to actually feel like we've got it going on. <laughs> and we're trying to avoid this kind of backlog of dealing with the suffering and dealing with the difficulty of sitting in our own material, processing that, you know, even on a pretty mellow day, we're taking in a lot from those around us in the world and to kind of distract ourselves consistently and to seek our sense of well-being and comfort outside, it just, it creates so much um, extra havoc in our life. And, you know, I think it's two chapters from now, but this beautiful quote, you know, in our very haste towards happiness, we trample over the very <laughs> causes and roots of that happiness. So in our busyness towards trying to seek happiness out there, we trample over our, right? Like it's hard to feel happy when you're so busy and stressed out doing all the things to make you happy. <laughs> and that's such a funny, common experience. Um, and again, not to posit that everything outside is like bad or wrong. It's just finding that harmony where we have like a kind of proportional investment and understanding in the material world. Like it's nice to have nice clothes and to live in a place that's clean and eat healthy food, um, nachos sometimes. Um, but it's also really good to be investing in our spiritual well-being, like with the compassion, with the care, with the settling of the mind. Like we got to kind of give due effort. And, you know, I think there was another um, quote that I was reading about these four remembrances that if people actually paid attention to these, we would all be practicing like our hair was on fire. You know, that common phrase that practice like your hair is on fire, practice like it's the only thing that matters, practice like it is the lifeblood of your body. So it's interesting, you know, that uh, I guess advertising and capitalism definitely has us convinced that things in the outside world are going to be that happiness. And it's so natural to want happiness. It's so natural. So that's, that's the kind of reminder. And, and it is kind of helpful when we have that like samsara doesn't cut it moment, right? So a great example is often when you make all these plans, spend all these resources, getting yourself on vacation somewhere, and then you're in a bad mood the whole time. And you're like, yeah doesn't work, right? So can be good and helpful for us to pay attention for the limits of samsara, right? The ways it doesn't show up. Any, anyone have an example of the limits of samsara that you notice? When you binge to watch the whole season? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it is, you know, again, like we were this uh, talking about craving earlier in the chapter, this mind of craving, and it's the um, full-blown hell, right, of desire, and the way that Pema Chodra describes it, it's this ancient tale of someone who is walking up a mountain full of razor blades towards what appears to be a beautiful woman um, who they feel so much desire for. And they get to the top of the mountains shredded and then turns into a demon and bites their head off. But then the next morning, they're back at the bottom of the mountain like, ooh, she looks good. <laughs> you know, like, get my way back up there. It's like, that's craving. That's just like, um, 
So we got to remember all the time. You know, it, yeah. Nice looking demon woman up there, but <laughs> I'm going to meditate a little longer and see how I can build like Claudia described that just sense of such joy and refuge in our own practice, you know, in our own sense of being. So let's um, give ourselves a couple moments to reconnect to practice. Softening through the face and the chest and the belly. Seeing if we can invite that sense of rejoicing or relief of being in this body. And while the mind may often kick up its storms, recognizing there is this deeper level and layer of who we truly are, in which there is great warmth, contentment, care. Considering a prospective intention in the future, can we invite ourselves to remember, to keep alive these invitations for remembering. And if it feels comfortable and natural, placing the hands together in front of the heart, a gesture of offering. And considering if there's any benefit to this practice of our time together. If there's an energy that we have created and cultivated through our hearts and minds. We symbolically and meaningfully offer this energy up to all beings of all time, to this beautiful world which needs us. May each and every being know peace and ease. May each and every being feel love and belonging. May each and every being find perfect freedom. Thanks, everyone.